Hi everyone, welcome to Peer-to-Peer -Peer Real Estate Show. And before I get to my guest, Nathan Tabor, I want to talk about some real estate news. There's an article from Realtor.com and it talks about the annual homeownership, homeownership rate. So in 2016, the home ownership rate was 63.4%. In 2017, it went up slightly to 63.9%, which is a good sign. You, you know, obviously the economy is doing much better. Hopefully our wages will go a little higher or, or grow a little higher. Um, you know, with Trump lowering our taxes, we'll see how that looks in a, a year from now. Uh, this is 2018 when I'm doing this, obviously. But I think it's a good sign that the home ownership is going up. Uh, my niche is owner financing. So what we try to do is buy properties at low end, then put them back on the market for slightly higher price, but carry the note for 7, 10, or 15 years. So we're trying to promote home ownership. Uh, and seeing this on Realtor.com, it's a, definitely a good sign for, for home ownership, hopefully in the future. So uh, that's the news, and we'll try to try to segment out show by show to see how it fits. If you guys like it, we'll try to come up with obviously you know no more than a couple of minutes. I don't want to bore you guys to death. So uh, so that's the news for now. And now this. Now a word from one of our partners. If you are unlucky enough to be on the losing end of a major lawsuit and you own a real estate business, you would have wished that the thought of protecting your assets had come up in the conversation before the judge rendered his decision and your fate. So act now while you can. Go to peer2peerrealestate.com forward slash asset protection. That's peer, the number two, peerrealestate.com forward slash asset protection. And you'll see the great products that this company, Royal Legal Solutions, has to protect your assets. Don't forget, peer-to-peerrealestate.com forward slash asset protection. Now, a word from one of our partners. Can't afford to pay someone to do your website? Well, how about using Weebly? Your website is waiting. It's time to launch. Tell your story with a beautiful website, online store, or blog with Weebly's drag-and-drop website builder, integrated e-commerce platform, and responsive themes. You can build a professional website without any technical experience. Go to peer-to-peerrealestate.com forward slash Weebly. That's peer, the number two, peerrealestate.com forward slash Weebly. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Peter Peer Real Estate Show. I'm your host, Willie Morales. And on today's show, I have Nathan Tabor. Uh, he's uh, successfully founded and operated more than two dozen businesses since 1999, grossing over $150 million in gross sales. His experience spans the areas of automobile sales, direct product sales, web-based marketing, strategic partnership facilitation, and commercial real estate acquisition and redevelopment. Since 2006, Nathan has bought renovated and flipped over $52 million of multifamily apartments, ranging from 12 units to 121 units. Nathan has some amazing success and epic failure, and he has learned more from his failures than his successes. Nathan, thank you so much for being on Peer to Peer Real Estate. How are you, sir? Oh, good, good. Well, I appreciate you having me on your show, and thank you for your time today. No, it's my pleasure. So, Nathan, tell us a little about yourself. How did you, you know, what made you branch out to be an entrepreneur? What was that aha moment for you? Pretty much, you know, my dad growing up, he was a preacher on the weekends, but a painter during the week. And so I kind of grew up in that culture of, you know, hey, start a business and, you know, do your business, you know, make money for yourself, provide for your family. Mm -hmm. After I, you know, uh, undergrad and grad school, I went to work for a political consulting group. But then my brother started a soy company. I came to work for and, and partner in the company. And then it just kind of, from there, you know, I was there for six years, and I had a buy here, pay here car lot for 11 years. And during that time, I had a media company doing emails and websites. And I figured out I'm a really good facilitator, seeing something that, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is, but you can make money off of it and starting a company and then finding, you know, good quality people to run it. My aha moment for real estate was a guy walked into my office and said, Hey, I've got an 18 unit complex for sale but it's got a lot of deferred maintenance issue and it's got a lot of occupancy issues. And you know, I'd never bought, I bought a, two homes. I bought one, sold it, upgraded to a little bigger one, but I had never done real estate. But I looked at the numbers and 
you know, thought, hey, you know, I knew numbers from the business side, but the first five banks I went to that I had done business for years said no. I mean, it was like first one, no, second, no, third, no, fourth, no, fifth, no. And the fifth one was like, okay, go down this little community bank. So long story short, the community bank did 100% financing, 100% renovation in 2006, which does not exist anywhere that I know of in the in the current market. <laughs> exactly. And now I heard you, or just real quick for clarity, you go by Willie, correct? Yeah, you call me Willie. Well. William. Okay. No, I know no, your Willie's emails. Are, so <laughs> well, want to make sure. So, so Willie, I bought the 18 unit, a 12 unit right behind, uh, used to be one u- complex. The 12 unit guy said, Hey, will you buy mine? So I bought the banks at 100% renovation, 100% financing. So I bought that one. From the time I closed on the first 18 units, eight and a half months later, I had renovated, had started leasing the complex up. We were about to 80%. And an investor came in from Maryland and paid me $850,000. And I had $500,000 in the deal. Wow. By the time I paid my realtors and taxes and that, I, I walked away with about $252,000 off of an eight-and-a-half-month project. That's amazing. I mean, that's a uh, three- or four-year salary for some people. So, Nathan, let me ask you a question. Why do you think those five banks turned you down? Did they give a reason why they turned you down? Or at least the property uh, yeah. down? Was it? It wasn't their market. And, you know, one uh, thing that I understand now, you know, you think, oh, I can go to a bank. A bank? lends money. But, you know, we were talking a little bit at the beginning off air about your niche. And I know we're going to talk about that. Banks have their niche as well. Some banks okay. like to do land and construction. Other banks won't. So if you walk into one bank and you're trying to get a deal done and they say no, that's not a no across the board from all banks. That just means that bank doesn't like that deal. If you have decent credit or better credit and a bank says no, it's probably not you. It's the bank doesn't have, you know, BB&T. Do you all have BB&T up north yet? Is, is BB&T no, up I can't in, say in, we do. In BB&T opinion, I can't the, say we have it, yeah. Oh, they're big. They're the, like the fifth largest bank in the U.S., so the south and kind of out west. They don't lend on okay. apartment complexes at all right now. Their multifamily fund is full. So if you take a deal to BB&T, on apartments, they say no right now because they're not lending to anyone on apartments. I see. And so you know, so going to those first five great point. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I don't mean to control. I'm just saying that it's a great point because I didn't know, you know, that, yes, it, it which makes sense. Banks have their own criteria. Now that you explain it, I can see some of the reasons why, okay, they didn't lend on this deal, but they actually go or uh, recommend that you go to a community bank. So talk more about the community bank. Well, you know, community banks are one of those that sometimes looked over. You know, community banks won't lend to people who don't live in the community. So if you're in New York trying to buy something in North Carolina, a community bank here is not going to lend to you. So they're more for right. if you're, you know, investing in your town, in your area, a community bank can be a great resource because they don't have as many hoops normally to jump. They're a little more personable. Mm-hmm. They're a little easier to get in contact with. And, you know, that really comes down any bank you go to. When you go to someone, the more information, the the business plan, the, the demographics, investor packet, whatever you have, you know, just calling a banker up and saying, hey, you know, will you do this deal with me versus setting up an appointment and going in and showing them your plan, you're yeah. going to get a better response. And here's the yeah. thing I learned so, early on. I'm 40, I'm 44. The thing I learned early on, there were some banks at the beginning that told me no. And just thankfully, I didn't, instead of being like, oh, what are you talking about and storming out of their office? I was like, well, thank you. Can I keep in touch with you? And every time I have a deal, I take it to a slew of bankers and bankers that told me no 11 years ago, sometimes say yes, sometimes they say no. So do, do, you know, okay. just for your listeners, don't burn a bridge just because someone says no, go back to them with the next deal. Okay. No, that's that's a good point and good advice. So, Nathan, when you got the 18 unit, what kind of what was your process or what was your due diligence in acquiring this 18 unit? Since this was was this your first was your first, this was your first deal? Yeah. So, you know, the due diligence I did on the first deal versus the due diligence I do today, you know, night and day. I thankfully I didn't get caught on the first deal. Uh, there were relatively no surprises. 
But over the years, you know, my second deal, I got a surprise that it wasn't zoned right. So the mm -hmm. the attorney uh, and the surveyor told me it was grandfathered in. When I bought it, went to pull my building permit, the grandfathering had been lost because of a setback. Who would think? I you know, did a title insurance claim and lost. So you know, every deal I buy now, I call or go down to the zoning department and get a letter, own letterhead, signed stamp that that piece of property, I don't care if it's a lot, a little house, or a big commercial, that it is zoned what it says it's zoned for. So would you, you know, recommend heard, that all investors do that? Go down to absolutely. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the first thing, if you're going to buy a piece of property, because here's what happened. You know, I made 252000 on my first deal. I lost 150000 on my next because a zoning issue. Okay. Wow, that's I, I I'm I, I'm glad you gave that uh, nugget for uh, for my listeners because you know we don't I think we some of us take for granted the due diligence process and look what happened on your second deal. So now moving forward, do you have a checklist or due diligence checklist for every property or or anything that you might get into business wise? Yeah. So and I don't mind sharing with you if you want to you know for free and give yes, it to please. your listeners. Sure. I'll email it to you and you can include it. I have a checklist of everything from both physical to financial, you know, just random things like who owns the mailboxes, who owns the fire hydrants. I mean, things that you, you know, the things you walk up and look at windows, doors, gutters, roof, but even on roofs. I don't buy a, a, anything now until myself or someone that I know gets on that roof and walks on it. Because you can have brand new shingles on a roof, which happened to me, bought a complex, brand new shingles, and the roof's leaking. You know what they had done? They had gone up there, all the underneath, the boards, and the roof, and, the, and half the trusses were rotted out. So before, I, wow. before they put it on the market, they went up and put a brand new roof on it, which cost them you know, $12,000, but it was about $40,000 to fix the issue. Right. Wow. Uh, you, you know, I, I, just little… Just, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just saying uh, just no, I'm something sorry. Go ahead. like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Nathan, but I'm just saying something like that is so important. The little details, the big details, just having, like you said, the, the, the importance of due diligence because, you know what, something can bite you in the ass. And, you know, you're learning as you go, especially when you're a new investor, but even as you, you know, gain knowledge throughout the years, hey, you can still miss something. But I appreciate definitely that, that checklist that you're going to give my listeners because that's so important to have, especially in, in this day and age, because now, you know, banks might be, might be, you know, not lending as much because of, you know, the, uh, the feel of the economy, even though it's, you know, rising, every, it seems like every day, but at least having that, that checklist, that doing your due diligence definitely can get you a good deal if you know what you're doing. And especially if you're ready to, to move on to that next level, like you did. So Nathan, what yeah. made you get into flipping afterwards? Just the situation of being able to go in, renovate a property. Now, I always buy to keep because you don't okay. know if you can actually sell it. So, you know, when I go in and I have to get a construction loan, I need to have a permanent loan in place because, you know, it might not sell at the time in the time I want it to. So, okay. if, you know, as a flipper, you know, a lot of times what happens in flippers mentalities is they go in, they slap a coat of paint on something, they dress the pig up, right? I'm from the South, and, and we, 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 we put <laughs> lipstick on a pig. Pig, yeah. What I've heard happened? That term. Yeah. Yeah, you've heard that term. Well, what happens when you go in to renovate a property and you fix it and make it look nice, but then it doesn't sell for 12 or 18 months? So you've got to fix things it. right from the beginning because you never know how long you're going to have to uh, keep it. Right. That's a good point. You, and, and the thing is, Nathan, so for you, when you look at a multifamily, right, a 12 unit, 20 unit, whatever it is, what's your first step that you do? I mean, do you look at the financials first or do you look at inside the property first? Like, can you give us like a, like a two, three step process of how do you, you know, what you do diligence in terms of looking at, the, at a multifamily? So here's my formula, and this can be used for single family up to how many ever units you want to put it to. You know, two processes here. One, you know, driving by the property to see what kind of condition it's in. Just, but you know, before you spend too much time on it, right? Drive by and visually see. Well, you can tell, you know, things are duct taped, windows are duct taped together, and there's mismatched doors and that. But there's a lot of work to be done. 
So I run my numbers this way. I run a deal before I ever make an offer or anything. What's the property worth? On the best day, if everything were fixed and it was rented, what's it worth? So for easy math, let's say it's worth a a million dollars. Well, when I sell it at a million dollars, I know I have to pay a realtor uh, four to six percent. So okay. uh, again, for easy math, we'll, we'll put it at 5% for $50,000. So I know right off the top, $50,000 is going to a broker. And then I start running my numbers. How much is the renovation? Well, off the visual, I can kind of tell. Like you, you do homes. If you drive by a home and it's a 2,000 square foot home and it's in bad shape, you can kind of really quick know, well, probably the kitchen, if the outside's in bad shape, the kitchens and the bathrooms and the floors and the ceilings and the lighting and the, all, all that needs to be done. And you can kind of put a number to that, right? Okay. So yeah, I, I know, and, yeah. you know, just for rough numbers before you spend too much time. So I know in, sure. in, the, in North Carolina, in my market, about $10,000 a door, excluding HVAC and electrical, I can renovate a unit and make it look beautiful. So if this million dollars is for a 10 unit complex, let's say 20, I got $200,000 of renovation. So then I add 20% for anything that I miss. So now I'm at 240. So I got to pay the the broker 50,000. I got to pay renovation 240,000. So I'm at $290,000. So I know right there I'm at 710,000. Well, now I want to make some money, right? So what do I want to make on this project? Well, I want to make $210,000. Keep the numbers easy in my because I'm doing all this in my head. So now I'm at $500,000. Sure, sure. So by the time I pay the broker, by the time I do the renovations, by the time I make my money, I can't spend more than a half a million dollars buying that project. Anything over a half a million dollars comes out of my pocket. Mm-hmm. The renovations aren't going to change. My broker fit my hard cost are not going to change. When you're flipping, the only thing that can change is if you miss something that costs you more or your you know, cost, you've overpriced it. The number one thing I see in flippers that they do is they say, this is worth more than it actually is. Because that's the only way they can make their numbers work. Right. If that house is worth $100,000 in five comps, say the exact same type of house is sold for $100,000, do you know what you're going to sell that house for? Hopefully $100,000 because that's right. what the market says it's worth. It doesn't matter. If you go in and put in marble countertops and beautiful hand-hewn floor, you know, wood plank flooring, and you put that property on the market for $129,000, you might sell it. But statistically, you've made it impossible for you to sell that because – You're not in the comps. Same thing in single family or multifamily, that applies. Right, and you're pricing yourself out of the market by doing that. Okay, no, that's great. I I love the way that you work from, what's that saying? With the end in mind, you already got your broker fee, you got what your construction cost is going to be, what your profit is, and then you work from there. And then you can't pay, for example, no more than $500,000 because anything over that, then it's going to come out of pocket. That's perfect, pretty much the perfect uh, pitch in terms of doing your due diligence for the audience because you're running the number from you. I mean, like I said, you have the end in mind. You know, you're working backwards. And that's important because we don't hear too much of that. I know in my circle, it, they just, you know, pretty much estimate stuff and construction. But since you almost have it down, I'm not going to say test science, but you have it down that with your experience, you know what to look for. You know what to spend. You know what to not go over. You know the maximum allowable offer is, and that's perfect. So. Nathan, yeah. so if someone brand new wants to get into the business of fix and flip, what kind of advice can you give them? Is that something that you would tell them to go to or would you tell them to wholesale? Because you see a lot of these uh, people say they should start with wholesaling, especially the newbies. What would you advise for someone that wants to get into the real estate field? Well, so the first piece of advice I give anyone wanting to get into anything in life is what is your niche? So if you're coming into real estate, Too many times people don't define what they want to do and they end up doing nothing but spending a lot of time learning about all kinds of things, but they never actually do anything. Have you ever seen that little movie Up, the little animated series with the little dog and the dog's always doing squirrel? You know, he's talking with someone and the squirrel comes by and he goes, squirrel. And he goes, come and he's talking again. He goes, squirrel. You know, it's, it's 
someone's mindset never becomes focused because they're like, oh, here's an opportunity. Oh, I can do wholesaling. Uh, oh, I can do flipping. Oh, I can do raw land. Oh, I could do a trailer park. Oh, I could do duplexes. And they never do anything. Nathan, that was me. I admit I was all over the place because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So it took me up to a couple of years ago to finally just focus on one thing and stay on at that one thing. But then, Nathan, how would you be an experienced business person? So then how can you get someone out of that mindset that they want to do 17 things at one time and not pick that niche? What can someone like you or me say to a newbie? Okay, we could tell them to pick that niche, but if they see HDTV and they see the Fix and Flip stars, whoa, wait a minute, that's what I want to do. But I don't think they yep. see, you know, like HDTV makes it look easy. And you know, being a fixer and flipper yourself, how easy is it to fix and flip, Nathan? Give us the, the rundown. Obviously, it's not, right? Yes. So, you know, this is what I do with people and encourage your, your folks and listeners to do. It's not as easy as HGTV makes it look. It's not as easy as these courses, you know, buy this, you know, these six discs and you'll learn everything you need to know. Those are good educational courses to be involved with. But it really comes down to a couple things. One major one, I'll save it to the end. How much time do you have? If you have a full-time job, if you have a family, somebody has to manage a flip or somebody has to manage wholesaling notes. So you got to have the time to do it first, right? Or you got to carve that time out. I work with you know some folks and they're like, oh, well, you just don't have time. But they watch six hours of football every Saturday and Sunday, but they don't have time. <laughs> well, what do you want to do? Because it, it takes time to be successful at something, right? I agree. The second and the most important is money. And it's a topic most people don't want to talk about. But you either have to have money or you have to have the ability to raise money. And I've had to do both. You know, if you've got money, then great. You know, be wise in what you're doing. Find your niche. If you need to, Willie, myself, some, you know, find a mentor to help you through some deals so you don't lose your shirt. No, I was going to say, you just hit it right on the head, being a mentor. And someone for, like you, uh, Nathan, you obviously you can mentor people because you've been doing it longer, but also you have experience. You've been on the field. You, you know, you're not selling that thirty-five thousand dollar course with, like you said, the six, seven DVDs. You took action. You got out there to take action, and you learn from your mistakes. And I think that's the key is for any new investors to get out there and, like you said, find a mentor and to take action. Oh, you know, you think about what you did, you know, and you're you're trying to find your niche and what I did. You know, hindsight, if I could have paid someone $500 or $1,000 a month to run things by, I would have saved hundreds of hours and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars by ask, laying my pride aside and asking some questions. Yeah. So I was like, well, I know all of this. I made two hundred. I made. I'm doing my shirt here. I made two hundred fifty-two thousand dollars on my first deal. I know what I'm doing. And smack, I lost <laughs> one hundred fifty thousand on the second deal because I didn't know what I was doing. Right. Uh, the second part of the money side, and people say, oh well, I just can't raise money. Well, yes, you can if you're doing it right. If you go to mom or dad or uncle or friend or church friend or, or coworker or the person you throw darts with, whoever it may be, and say, hey, I'm a real estate investor. Will you invest with me? The answer statistically, 99.99 to the infinity is no. Right. Because you, you didn't give them any information. And how many other times have you tried to get them to quote unquote and invest in something that you're doing that you never followed through with? If you take an no. investor packet to someone and I come to you and I say, Willie, I don't really know you, but I've got this deal, and here it is. Here's the summary page, and then here's the investor packet behind it, and it's five, six, seven pages, and it says where the property is or where a potential property could be, what the cap rate is, or if it's you know, res- if it's commercial, if it's residential, what the comps are, how much money you're going to need, how you're going to do your banking, who, you know, who's the contractor going to do your renovations, and you put this entire program together, you know what you just said to that person? I'm serious about this. Yeah, because you put in the hard work of getting the paperwork and all the due diligence together. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so then all of a sudden it changes the perception of someone instead of them having 99 questions. The only question now is, do you want to do this deal or not? Because you just gave them all the information. 
And then you start setting up meetings. You go out. I mean, you know, you go to the first person, they say no. And you go home, you go, oh, I just can't be a real estate investor. He said no. Or she said no. Dude, put on your big girl britches or big boy britches and go ask 50 people. (laughs) Right. You know, it's not about the no's. It's about the yes. It's about the yes. Yes, I agree. Man, I'm, I don't know how so, old you so, are. I'm 44. How old are you, Willie? I'm 55. You're 55. I'm 44. There are some people that are older than me, my age, and younger than me that I just want to put my neck, or, you know, my hands around their neck, or put it on their their cheeks and pull them close to me and say, "Listen, get over this like entitlement mentality of you should just be able to go out and say I'm a real estate investor and be extremely successful." No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works anywhere. You read anything about any real estate investor, these courses that say, buy my course and you can be a millionaire in a year. No, you're not. I mean, you could be, but statistic, I mean, it's just not going to happen. It takes time and it takes hard work and it takes dedication and it takes succeeding. It also takes spelling. And we just need you know, people who are listening that, hey, you can do it. You can make a ton of money on real estate, but it takes work. Right. So, Nancy, for so so for a, a new investor that wants to get into the game, you would definitely recommend them to get like an investor packet because even though they might be new, but they might find a deal and get that partner. But if they show the paperwork and the hard work that they did by putting the uh, the work, it's possible even a newbie to get someone to get in, to go in on a deal with them. Right? Possible? Oh, absolutely. It increases your chances you know, tenfold, a hundredfold, you know, if you start going to a meetup group or a real estate group or online or your family and friends and you've put together a packet, you've gone from, you know, use this illustration. I'm an author. Oh, really? How many books have you published? Oh, I'm not finished writing my book yet, but I'm an author. Oh, okay. I mean, do you take that person serious? Are they an actual author? No, not really. (laughs) No, they're a wannabe author, right. So you keep going to people and saying, oh, I'm a real estate investor. Oh, how many deals have you done? Oh, I haven't done any yet. I'm I'm still working, trying to find my right deal. Oh, well, what type of real estate do you want to do? Oh, I'm not really sure. You know, I'm looking over here at this um, strip mall and I'm looking over here at this trailer park and I'm, you lost that person. They're gone. They might stand there with you and talk to you, but they're not going to do anything with you. But if you say, hey, I'm a real estate investor, I haven't done a deal yet, but I'm looking for deals in the south side in the $100,000 range that I can buy for $50,000 and put about $20,000 to $25,000, maybe thirty dollars in the renovations and make $20,000 to $30,000 on the deal. Oh, really? What type of return are you paying? Oh, well, then you've you've hooked them. I mean, you got got them right there because now you've given them a plan. And you know, people, key, I, I, talk, I talk, to, yeah. talk to you all the time. Oh, real estate brokers won't call me back. I can't get anybody. They're not calling you back because you said, hey, I'm a real estate investor. I'm looking for good deals. Willie, would you take your time and yeah. call that person back? No. I mean, what are you looking for? Where are you looking for? What price range are you looking for? Yeah. I, and, and that's the thing, Nathan. I, I met some newbie investors where, no, I haven't done a deal yet, but I'm looking. Okay. What's your criteria? Where are you looking? Uh, are you looking on the east side, the west side? Where? And so, you know what, Nathan? That's a good point. You know, said, doing the segue to, to my next question is, so what's a critical skill? Can you give one or two points? What What is a critical skill that an, either a new investor needs to have or an experienced investor needs to have in order for someone to take them serious? What one or two criteria do you think someone needs to have before someone says, hey, you know what? Besides, like you said, uh, having the report and having, you know, your, for lack of a better word, your shit together, yeah. what would you recommend? Uh, the first one's diligence. Be diligent in what you're doing. Be diligent in your your paperwork and your education and what you're doing. You know, stop procrastinating. Stop thinking about it. Stop reading books about it and go start doing something. You know, I tell people, if you you don't have the money to get in real estate right now, but you want to be in it, go to work for a construction company. Become a project manager or go to work for a property management company. You know, find the area that you want to do. If you don't have the money, go work in that industry. Go ask someone, hey, will you take me underneath my arm and teach me what you know? Go find a flipper and say, hey, I don't, I don't have any money. I don't want any of the deal, but could I just come help you on the weekend so I can learn this at business? Do something. The second yeah. is humility. You know, I don't know everything. You, if you ask me a question right now that I don't know, you know what my response is? Willie, I don't know, but let me get back to you on that. Because if you're asking me a question, you most likely already know the answer. You want to know if I know the answer. And if I start telling you something that I'm trying to make up and it's not accurate, what do you think about me? 
Yeah, no, I, I'm going to think that Nathan doesn't know what he's talking about. He's making things up as he goes. Nathan, I see you later. <laughs> yeah, I definitely won't take it serious. But I, I would definitely you won't take more serious or anybody. Yeah, if, if like you said, hey, I don't know, but I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, I think that's perfect. I don't think enough people do that. I think they try, too many people try to fake their way into getting into real estate or trying to impress someone. And then they wonder why the person they met that was interested doesn't call them back. That could be the re. I mean, I do it. If somebody, I, I can tell when I ask somebody a question, I can tell if pretty much straight up if they're being honest with me, if they're being upfront, and if they're not, why? If somebody's going to lie to you about a simple question, why would you ever do business with them? No, exactly. And so that happened in newbies, in the people coming in, they think that the way to get in with someone is by showing how much they know. And then you become the know-it-all. You become the annoying person that no one wants to be around. So back off a little bit. You know, Put your opinion out there. Talk about things. Answer questions that you know. But if you don't know, have a little humility and say, hey, you know what? I haven't ran across that yet. I'm going to be honest with you. I've never had anything to do with that. I sure would like to learn about it. Could you share something with me or could I work with you on this? You know, I like that advice about, you know, being, you know, have that humility. You know, so Nathan, in the years you've been in business, is there someone that you look up to in the business world or in the real estate world, so to speak? You know, from from the real estate side, you know, I've I've been involved in the various of the, you know, reading of the Joe Ferris and Michael Blank. And then I ran across you on LinkedIn and, and others that. You know, obviously, they have programs or they're doing what they're doing, but they're kind of out there. Yeah, me, from a, a personal side, my greatest mentor is a retired pastor friend that I can go sit down with and have an open, honest, you know, hey, Howard, I don't know what to do here. You know, I've made a mistake or I've got a decision to make, you know, and I just lay it out and he doesn't judge me. He doesn't condemn me. He he just looks at it from a third party view and he never answers the question, but he gives me one or 10 things to think about. Whereas when I was a little younger, I used to just shoot from the hip and be like, oh, I'll go with this. And I didn't really think about the actual situation. I didn't sit down and right. spend a little time. I thought, oh, this, you know, this is what I'll do. And, it, and normally when you make a big decision without consulting with someone, normally not going to go very well in the end. It might work for a time. So that's been my, probably not the answer you were looking for, but. No, no, you know, but it makes sense. To, I, I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's good to listen to other folks and, and glean their knowledge. But at some point you need to get in front of someone and talk through what you're going through because my story doesn't apply to you and your story doesn't apply to me. But I could sit down and ask you a question and, and you might give me a perspective that I've never even thought about that's the exact solution that I need. Right. No, and that's a great point. You know, so Nathan, in, since you've been a real estate investor, uh, entrepreneur, besides your second deal where you lost money, is, has that been your most challenging time in business or... Now, have you found others? Because that's a, that's a challenge in your second deal. You lose that much money and you recovered, obviously. But up to this point, was that your most challenging business, um, let's say, failure? It, I hate to say failure, but, it, you know. Yeah, it was a, it was a failure because ultimately, you know, from what I, I've studied, I'm not a lawyer, but from all 48 states, I've never looked at the other two states, you know, a contract, real estate contracts, the four corners. So when you close on your property, it's your property. The only way right. to ever go back on someone is if they fraudulently did something. But if they did everything right and you did everything right, you know, it's yours. So I've had some challenges in my buying. Um, rent rolls mean nothing. On residential to 100 plus units, a rent roll is simply a regurgitation of the facts of the lease. Nathan Tabor lives in this unit and he should be paying this much and his lease started here and ended here. So I bought a complex right. that's supposed to be per the rent roll, collecting $28,000 a month. I closed and collected $7,000 the next month. I was like, what? Started talking to the tenants and they was like, oh, you know, the owner told us not to say anything, but we hadn't paid in three months or six months. We've got an, our toilet doesn't work or, you know, this doesn't. And I was like, when I walked around and asked you all if there was anything wrong, you said, oh, everything's good. And they said, oh, well, you know, the owner told us if we said anything bad to you, he'd kick us out. Oh, wow. So the only way you can catch money, this is, you know, in the due diligence side, is bank statement. 
how much was deposited. And if someone can't give me two years worth of bank statement, I don't even trust tax returns. Do you know what the IRS doesn't care about? They don't care if you want to inflate how much money you made. They only care if you cheat them and report less than you made. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. (laughs) So on a rent roll, if someone says they're collecting $5,000 a month and they put on their tax return that they collected $60,000, but the bank statements only show that they collected $40,000, what'd they do with that $20,000? Right. Maybe they didn't collect it. You would talk up bank statements as definitely for you that you need to see because this way you see. So in other words, so the pro forma is something that you might look at, but you're not going to pay any credence to it because it's um, obviously the numbers could be falsified. Absolutely. You know, the accountant or the owner or, you know, if you go to buy a house in Pennsylvania and it's quote unquote renting for a thousand dollars a month and they put that in their pro forma and you buy it and the person says, oh, I'm only paying 750 a month. What do you do? Right. You're out $250 a month. Yeah. So okay. you take well, the bank statement. Know. If you take the bank statement and they're paying 750, then you, before you go hard on your contract, you can rene- renegotiate the price. I see. No, that's a, that's sure a definitely good, good, good advice on for new investors and even old ones or to check oh, out. Oh yeah, this, their yeah, bank this, this is new. And don't rely on their pro forma. Okay. Yep, sewer issues. Two of the most expensive things you'll get into outside of the bank statement side, uh, electrical. When you go in to buy a property, I don't care if it's one unit or 500 units, I go to Lowe's and buy one of those little $5 electrical outlet checkers. You know what I'm talking about? You plug it in and the the light comes on. Oh, yes. And you know what I do in every complex that I buy? I check or someone on my team checks every plug in every unit. I don't trust what the tenants are saying. After I learned that tenants weren't going to tell me the truth because the landlord was going to quote unquote kick them out, we check everything because how much does it cost to rewire a a, a three bedroom, two bath apartment unit? In the South, it's you know thirty five hundred to five thousand dollars per unit. Right. And it takes one person less than 10 minutes to check the plugs. So if you're buying a single family home, check every plug. Go buy one of those five dollars and because if half the you know you the, the person's walking around they're turning on lights and you're like oh the electrical works great well the light switch might but what if that plug doesn't in that room you got to right. cut the sheetrock out and run new wiring over to the box wow that's great I mean that's that's definitely some good advice so Nathan uh, tell me about yeah God sorry well that other one sewer lines you know you can flush a mm-hmm. toilet or turn a sink on. I got called. I bought a, a complex, and the day I bought it, all the tenants called and said, oh, your raw sewage is backing up in our toilet and our bathtubs. I was like, what? And he's like, oh, yeah, it's been doing this forever. I was like, why didn't y'all tell me? Oh, well, the owner told us, you know, if we did, it'd kick you out. This is the fourth unit I did. So by, now, by this time, I figured out what I needed to do. But the sewer line under the concrete foundation, the main pipe was collapsing in areas with rocks and roots and others. I had to move all the tenants out from the bottom, jackhammer the floor two and a half, three feet down the center and replace a main line, $84,000. Do you know how I figured out how to resolve that? I went Mm -hmm. to the housing authority and pulled two years worth of city complaints. You know, in every area, a renter can call someone, a municipality, the town, someone that will come out and cite the owner for problems in their unit, single family up to multifamily. Well, if you're buying a piece of property, go pull two years worth of complaints, set them down and and get you an Excel sheet or a, a piece of paper and start looking for things that repeat themselves. Electrical outlets not working, toilet backing up tub backing up. If you see in two years that out of a 10-unit complex that all of them are having toilet issues and bathroom issues, that means the plumbing from the apartment to the city hookup is not working right and it needs to be replaced, which is really expensive. So if you catch that in your due diligence, you go to the owner and say, hey, there's a sewer issue here and I need to reduce the price of this property, whatever it costs to fix it. Because if you don't, that money comes out of your profit side. Pocket, yeah. So, hey, Nathan, so tell us about your your seven steps to regain balance and what did you do to achieve it? Because I thought that was pretty interesting, you mentioning that before in your bio. What happened and what did you do to get back on track? Yeah, you know, so there's this thought that exists that if you have money, you will it'll solve all your problems. And for me, I'm an evangelical Christian and I don't you know, wear my Bible on my sleeve and I'm not out, you know, wagging my finger at people. So there's evangelical Christian side of this. There's also just a good secular side that says this is just good advice. You know, from who are you as a person? 
Like, where, where are you with God or where are you in your life? You know, what's mm-hmm. holding you back? What, you know, everyone's got a story. And when you start talking with people, you'll get into, well, I can't do this because of this, right? You know, there's an excuse there. On the third side, we as humans have pride. And pride really holds us back from getting to where we need to get to. And it really produces problems for us. You've heard the old saying, a soft answer turns away wrath or, you know, keep your mouth shut. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> you know, think how many arguments would you have avoided or lawsuits or lost business deals or hurt feelings if you'd have just been quiet for five minutes? Right. I know for me, hundreds of times I can think instantaneously that if I'd have just shut my mouth for 60 seconds and listened to someone, I could have avoided a pretty big to epic battle. But my pride, no, got I, agree, like, I gotta be, I gotta be right. Patience. And from the God side of, you know, waiting on God, but also, you know, patience just in deals. Real estate doesn't go always like it says in the contract. You're supposed to close in 30 days and they contact you on the morning of the 30th day and say, we have an issue. We can't close for 10 more days. And you flip your lid. You could lose the deal. Right. Been there, done that. You know what you have to do when you start over? Have to relist the property and then you have to wait and you have to do all the due diligence again. So waiting seven days or 10 days versus starting the process over, which is smarter. But if we don't have patience, we flip our lid and we turn the table over. I like playing a board game with my wife. When she loses, she throws the board over sometimes. I mean, you know, what's the purpose, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, hope she doesn't hear I hope she doesn't hear this. You know, forgiveness. Forgiveness and bitter is, the, is kind of the fifth step in this. Of people are going to do you wrong. Really, people are going to do you wrong. People are going to do yeah. me wrong. I unfortunately try not to, but at times I do people wrong. And you know, at, we as one as Christians, but just as humans, we always want to point everyone else's issues out, what they did wrong, but we don't want to look at what we've done wrong. Right, exactly. And when you get that way, I mean, you start you start cutting corners, and you start, well, they did me wrong, therefore I have the right to do this person wrong. You know, I not think of it in your mind that way, but you've met those people and they're not, when you see them coming, you get to the point that you want to get away from them. The sixth and almost the last is, you know, making wise decisions or making prudent decisions. You know, you look at a, a deal and you try to make money on it versus knowing that it's a good deal, especially for people coming into it or seasoned. I myself, I have made deals work at the beginning you know what happened at the end? They didn't work out. Right. So back up and make wise decisions, better decisions on what you're doing. And the last is on the Christian side, you know, applying God's word to your daily life, not just knowing it, but actually applying it. And then on the secular side, knowing something and versus applying. Most people know that we should be kind to each other, but most people aren't. Right. No, I agree. Most people are. know we should be good stewards of our money, but most people aren't. And so it just kind of comes down when you start looking at real estate or you start looking at your yourself. I, you know, I for a long time thought that even as a Christian, that if I made enough money, I would get to a point that I had this balance in my life. And the most miserable I've ever been in my entire life was the time I had the most money. Because when I started making money, I had to make more money. When I made more money, I spent more money. When I spent more money, I had to make more money. And I got into this vicious cycle that to prove that I was doing well, I had to have material things. And I would, at one time I had five cars. I had a Porsche, a Prowler, a Hummer H1, a Tahoe, and a truck. And I was single. Right. Why did I need five cars for? Because that's what defined me as being successful. And there's nothing wrong with, there is nothing wrong with material things. I don't have any problems with, with people having beautiful and nice things. That's not my point. My point is, if those material things become what define you, and those are the things that you have to have to make you happy, brother and sister, it won't be long before you hit rock bottom if that is what makes you happy. Right. No, that's a good point. You know, and, and I think you, know, you found pretty much what was your core values, and you now stuck to it, and you're applying it. Uh, Nathan, as we're about to wind down the show, and there's a couple more questions I wanted to ask you, is for you or for your audience and my audience, what are your favorite books? What kind of books you like to read? And uh, is there anything you like to recommend? 
Yeah, I like, well, first, you know, by Proverbs. I think if everybody read Proverbs, Christian or not, and just applied the simplicity of how to interact with people, how to deal with mm-hmm. each other is great. I like, I like cliff notebooks. I, I'm not a big, I am a reader, but I'm not a, a huge reader. But really what I look for is things that help me define who I am. What is my purpose in this life? So, you know, I've got a, a book here. It's called Tapestry, Promises and Prophecy by Dr. Adrian Rogers. Is one that just happens to be laying on my uh, desk today. And then I have a, uh, this guy's own line, The Ask Method by Ryan. I always mispronounce, mispronounce his name, but it's a Levesque, L-E-V-E-S-Q-U-E. Okay. Uh, he's been around for about 20 years, and his ask method is, you know, it basically comes in and says, you know, what do people want? I mean, if you're going to talk to an investor, you got to know, you know, do a little research background on them. Who are they? What are they investing in? Um, you got to give people what they want. Uh, so it really talks about like finding your niche. I mean, that I spend a lot of time reading books on, you know, what am I supposed to do? Because if you start going out, I do business consulting too. And the kiss of death is just to put out there, oh, I'm a business consultant. Well, right. what kind of business? Yeah, what kind of business consultant am I? So those are the types of books I, you know, more you know probably guides and PDFs online that I I download to to get involved with. No, that's that's I, I do the same thing. I like PDFs that I can read either on my phone or my tablet. So yeah, no, I definitely want to look into that. You know, definitely Proverbs. But it's funny because I have I think I'm in my local RIA before I I think I joined. A couple of years later, they gave us a, like a maybe like five to ten pages of proverbs and money and what to do with it and how to nurse uh, you know nurture it and all that. So yeah, I definitely agree. I like that. I definitely want to look into that Ryan Levesky book. It's called Ask. You said he he runs a program called the Ask Method. A S K. Okay. Of course, he has a program. Method. He sells. He sells mastermind classes and one on one coaching. You know, like today, Proverbs twelve one. Uh, Mm -hmm. Depending on the translation you read, it says, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. I love that. So, you know, (laughs) very, very, very profound words. (laughs) Well, so, you know, I come to you and say, hey, Willie, I see you're doing this. Can I give you a can I give you a pointer? And you say, no, man, I, I got it under control. You're stupid, right? And I've done that many a time. Someone's come to me and tried to say, hey, Nathan, you know, if you just tweak this a little bit, it'd come out so much better. Hindsight, they were 150% right, but I didn't do it, and I paid the consequence for it. Well, that doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, right? I mean, that's just good advice. Good advice, yeah. And Nathan, as we're about to end this show, where can people find you? What's the best bet for someone to look you up? Yeah, so uh, pretty easy. My website is Nathan, N-A-T-H-A-N. Tabor, and that's T-A-B-O-R dot com. And once you land on the web uh, page there, there's a button for real estate. It'll take you to my real estate information. And there's some information about my personal story and uh, finding balance. And uh, I've written a couple of different books that there are free to download from there, both on apartments and on just life in general. No, that's perfect. And I'll definitely, everyone, uh, Nathan's going to be kind enough to send us his checklist his due diligence checklist because that's important going forward you have to do this your checklist from a to z you don't want to miss anything and like nathan said before you don't want to make that second deal of yours a loser and not to say that nathan's a loser but you know what nathan recovered but because he became smarter and smarter as he did his due diligence every time he purchased a property listen nathan talked about bank statements so definitely you know, if you're going to talk to an owner, whether it's a single family or multifamily, also don't rely on the pro forma. Check every plug in the, in every room, and also don't forget the sewer lines. Those are important points that Nathan mentioned throughout the show. Nathan, I I can't say enough. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being on Peter Peer Real Estate. You gave us so much knowledge. I, I don't know what to say. I appreciate your time. I really do. Willie, I appreciate what you're doing. I, I really uh, appreciate you letting me uh, come on your show and share. You know, there's, you know, just on on wrapping up here. You know, I want people to know. You know, do 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 it. Get out and and start doing something. And 
you know, don't, you know, some people might say, oh, well, you're a Christian. You brought that into and you should keep your, hey, you know, be who you are. Be proud of who you are, right? But don't be critical of others. I appreciate you letting me share my faith on here, and I appreciate you uh, letting me talk about real estate as well. No, I again, Nathan, uh, it was my pleasure. I I appreciate uh, uh, you taking time to the schedule. Also, guys, you can find Nathan on Joe Fairless's show. I think it's the best real estate advice ever. Is that the um, is that the name of his show? If I'm correct, yes, that's correct. Yep. And also, you can find Nathan on Michael Blank show. Michael Blank show is a multifamily show. I can't remember uh, his name, um, his show off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, I, w- I was I was looking to see here. I don't remember his exact. I know it's Michael <laughs> Blank something there. So <laughs> yeah, don't worry. His, his name. I'll is, definitely put on the show notes. I'll put on the show notes, and then just so you could uh, uh, hear uh, Nathan's other interview, I'll definitely put the website up on. So on the show notes, I'll we'll pretty much have everything that Nathan talked about today, and any websites and books that he mentioned will definitely be on the show notes. So anyway, Nathan, again, thank you so much for being on Peter Peer Real Estate, and um, please keep up the good work. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Willie. And I will email you those uh, various forms and, and some links to some free books as well. Sounds good, Nathan. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon, buddy. All right. Thanks, Willie. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it, folks. That was Nathan Tabor today on Peter Peer Real Estate talking about his amazing journey, his success, his failures. Uh, this is a man from 2006 who has bought, renovated, and flipped over $52 million worth of property. So go to his website at nathantabor.com. That's N-A-T-H-A-N-T-A-B-O-R.com. Download his free book, which is called The Guide to Finding Balance. That's nathantabor.com. Also, guys, Nathan was nice enough to send me his, uh, uh, his checklist for us to look at, to use as we please. So you go to peer-to-peerrealestate.com. That's peer to number two, peerrealestate.com. Go to the resources page and you'll see under the heading checklist. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening to Peter Peer. And before I go, just remember, guys, go for your dreams. Do not let anyone talk you out of it. It's your dreams. It's your goals. Go for it. Like I like to, like I always say, keep the momentum going. Good things will happen. Anyway. Thank you so much for listening to Peter Peer Real Estate. I'm Willie Morales. Oh, one more thing. Sorry, guys. Please go to iTunes. Look for us at Peter Peer Real Estate Podcast. Please subscribe. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can make this show better, how, how I could be better. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening to the show today. I'm Willie Morales. Until next time, have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.